Okay, Victor Hugo, The Man Who Laughs, and The Purple Hyacinth, a presentation by Mindy Slopper from The Story Thinker. So why did I read a 600 plus page book from the 1800s? Because it's kind of sort of mentioned in Purple Hyacinth number 38. So as you see in this excerpt, when Lauren goes to Kieran's house, she picks out a couple of books from his bookshelf, which are supposedly, presumably significant. She picks out The Secret Garden, The Killing Joke, and The Man Who Laughs. Now we discuss all three of these in um, episode 38 podcast, but this presentation is an in-depth analysis of the Victor Hugo novel. Now, I can read, I see that in the picture it says The Man Who Laughs by Ed Brubacher, which is the Batman comic, not the Victor Hugo novel, but I decided to go back to the original and see what that book has to say and how it's related to Purple Hyacinth. And upon completion of the book, I think there actually is a lot that is related to the Purple Hyacinth, both in theme and in plot, and I think that I have a great theory at the end. So hear me out and tell me what you think. So before we discuss the story, keep in mind that this story is very complicated, is very long, has a bunch of different segments, and seemingly they're all unrelated, but they actually are related. So bear with me, it'll all come together. So here we go. We start out learning about a man named Ursus. Ursus, which means wolf, by the way, is an old performer, and he lives by himself within a wolf named Homo. Obviously, Homo means man, so that's the irony. And he lives in a little wood box home, and inside the home, he has this giant diatribe against the nobility. Already, you can see some purple hyacinth uh, connection, can't you? Now, meanwhile, we also learn about this group called the Comprachicos. The Comprachicos are a horrible group of people who disfigure children and have them perform as freaks for the public. So you probably have heard about this. If you've seen The Phantom of the Opera, you'll remember they would take these people who had disfigurements of any kind and bring them to the circus or something and have people pay to see them. Very, very polite. And there is this group of people and they are escaping England by a ship. And while they escape, they abandon a child behind in this freezing, desolate area where nobody is. They leave him to die, basically, right? And <clears throat> they continue onto this ship, and as they rightfully deserve, this ship is attacked by these storms, and it goes through these, like, cliffs and chana channels and rocks, and basically they keep escaping, but finally the Lord's justice catches up to them, and they are about to drown. And realizing this, they decide, one of them decides, we have to write down a confession, of something that they have done and they all write it they write it down and they all sign and they put it into this bottle of this man named Harquinon and they toss it into the sea and then the water closes up around their head and boom they are dead also good riddance to them meanwhile this poor little boy is wandering around and he's trying to find shelter he walks and walks and walks and he's freezing he's freezing in the middle of the night like he's you know not really in good shape but he finds this baby and this baby is on a mother it's mother but this mother is dead she froze to death and this boy is like 10 and he decides 10 or 6 or 8 or something he's 10 and he picks up the baby he rescues the baby and he takes off his coat and he puts it on the baby so the baby stays warm so this guy is really really nice right um basically kind of like lets himself get cold so that he can save the baby he wanders around he reaches town he knocks on all the doors nobody opens up then he finds Ursus's fan, and Ursus does open up and gives him his last bit of food to share, and he decides to take him in. Now, obviously, the irony here is that the people in the town who, I wouldn't call them rich, I would call them middle class, whatever sort of middle class existed back then, it didn't really exist, but they were better off than this poor man Ursus, but they didn't take him in, and the poor man Ursus did. Obviously, a very telling lesson about wealth which is a running theme throughout this whole book. In case you didn't know, Victor Hugo doesn't really like wealthy people. Just saying. If you may, might know from his other works, such as Les Mis. So now, in something that does not seem related, but just you wait, we learn about a man named Lord Clan Charlie. So if you will remember your history, and in this book, Victor Hugo uses a lot of real historical figures in addition to his own made-up characters. So um, we have some real history here, which is that Lord Clan Charlie was part of the revolution against King Charles II. So if you remember, England went through a glorious revolution. For a brief period of time, they overthrew their monarchs. They had Oliver Cromwell installed. And then, well, boom, 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 they went back to the monarchy, right? So there's this guy, Lord Clan Charlie. He was part of the revolution against King Charles II. And he, after the revolution, he is currently exiled in Switzerland. And there are rumors that he has a son, but nobody has seen him. So 
who is his estate going to go to, right? Because every wealthy person had an estate, right? They had this massive bit of land. They had, um, they were able to be lords in the House of Lords, right? They had voting rights to decide in Parliament what's going to happen. Anyway, so who's it going to go to? So it goes to this guy, Lord David Dorimar. Who's Lord David Dorimar? He is the son of King Charles II and his mistress. By the way, this mistress used to be Lord Clan Charlie's mistress, and when Lord Clan Charlie up and left, she got super upset, went to Lord Clan, went to King Charles II, and had this baby, Lord David Dorimar, who is no longer a baby. Now, these monarchs and Oliver Cromwell have come and gone, and now we have King James II ruling. He and all the other nobles are upset at Lord Clan Charlie because, you know, Lord Clan Charlie is not supporting the monarchy, and he, out of all the nobles, refused to come back. So a lot of other nobles also participated in the Glorious Revolution, but when they saw the tides of turn for various reasons, when the monarchy returned, they went back to their original position, and they dropped their ideals, and they said, okay, now we're back to being monarchical again. And Lord Clan Charlie refused. He was still adamantly um, Republican and not monarchical, and he stayed in Switzerland, and they all hate him for that. So, and especially, to make matters worse, Lord Clan Charlie ended up marrying this woman named Anne Bradshaw, who was the daughter of John Bradshaw, who, by the way, was the judge who ordered that King Charles II deserved to be killed for his crimes against the people. That is real history. This man John Bradshaw did exist. He was the judge, and he did have King Charles II killed. So, obviously, they're all ticked off at him. Now, King James II has an illegitimate daughter named Josiana. I put an illustration of Darcy in here because uh, I know all of you love Darcy, but my impression of Josiana and Darcy are similar. So let me tell you about what kind of lady Josiana is. Anyway, so he has an illegitimate daughter, Josiana, and he wanted to provide for her. He um, he wanted to set her up to be noble. So he kind of like gave her a bunch of stuff and he's dead now. But his legitimate daughter, Queen Anne, again, this is all true. Queen Anne did exist. Josiana did not exist. Queen Anne is very plain, very simple. So she is jealous of Josiana. Josiana is pretty, she's charming, she's artful, she's witty. And she tells her, hey, you know, if you want to inherit Lord Clan Charlie's estate, you need to marry Lord David Arimore. And she tells Lord David Arimore, if you want to have the estate, you have to marry her. And they're, this suits them fine. They like being basically permanently engaged. They're both players. They both like to move, you know, I'm not going to say hook up necessarily. I don't know quite what they did. Lord Clan Charlie for sure. Josiana probably not. But they are players. They like to be charming. They like to go around. They like to be not tied down to anything. And they just go around being their nasty, selfish selves. Because it turns out both of them are selfish, um, especially Lord David. He is someone who is like a rogue. He goes around and abuses poor people for fun. They do. They have these awful games where they have these poor people are kind of like... Um, do like boxing matches and that end up maiming them and killing them and all for the rich people's entertainment. So once again, you can see a very heavy theme of anti-nobility um, in this. And Josiane herself is she's just a dumb flirt who likes to be selfish and admired. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm sorry that I, I for all the, the, the Darcy simps that I used her picture, but she kind of reminded me of her. So anywho, meanwhile, we meet this fellow called Barkil Bedro. Now, as you see from this picture here, he looks really evil because guess what? He's really evil. He is plotting. He's scheming. He's selfish. All he wants is to secure a position in the court. So what to do? He convinces Josiana. He's like, listen, Josiana, I really want this position. It's called Uncorker of the Bottles of the Sea. And in case you thought that this is a made up, I kid you not, there existed at the royal court all these useless little positions. And Victor Hugo goes into depth about like these stupid positions like with the person whose job it was to tie the king's shoelace. He got a full salary for a whole year. And the person whose job it was to, like, button the king's cape once a day. And all these people who are making these massive livings, um, basically they get these jobs as favors. And they are taking money, taxing the English population, and, um, you know, just scamming them, basically, right? <clears throat> Again, very anti-nobility. So he gets this position called Uncorker of the Bottle of the Seas. And basically this job is that anytime something comes in from the ocean that's in like a bottle, a um, message in a bottle, he gets to uncork it and present it to the queen. So again, how often does this happen? Not really, but it's in a useless position. He's excited about it. Now we go back to the poor abandoned disfigured boy. And it turns out his name is Gwynplaine. So Gwynplaine is all gr grown up. Ursus adopted him and the baby. The baby's name was Dia. And what they do, they have a traveling show. 
So they are performers and they go around and they perform this show. And it's a really nice show. Ursus is a one who wrote it himself. They, Dia sings. She's beautiful. Everyone loves her singing. And it's great. Now, Gwynplaine, da, 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 he was disfigured by the Compachicos. His face is in a laugh, perpetual laugh, right? The man who laughs. And it basically, throughout the performance, he keeps it covered. But then at the end, like the punchline, is he reveals it and everyone laughs and laughs and laughs. Right? So Gwynplaine, believe it or not, he's actually okay with it. Because he says, well, you know, this allows me to earn my living. And he has the family, he has Ursus, and he has Dia. Now, Dia is blind, so she doesn't see that he's disfigured and, and made ugly by this disfigurement. And she loves him for who he is. He's very kind. He's very moral. He's very good. And she, he loves her too. So wonderful. They're in love. It's great. And they make a decent amount of money performing as well. So they actually go to London and they set up a performance there. And there's some stuff that happens, which I'm trying to figure out if I should tell you now or later. Basically, let's just say Dia, uh, not Dia, Josiana is bored and she's like uh i don't know what to do with my life i have anyway i don't know um basically she's unfulfilled because she has nothing to do right because when you're rich and you have nothing to do with your life you're bored so she um goes to this play who told her to go to this play lord david during who by the way dressed up as a commoner called tim john jack to go to the show he tells her listen josiana i know you're bored go to the show they make this whole special section just for her Anyway, she goes there. She falls in love with Gwynplaine. She thinks she falls in love with Gwynplaine, right? So far. So they're having the show. It's successful. Josiana comes. She likes Gwynplaine. Fine. But the yeah, times are coming. The poor have no power in the society. And a marshal comes along. And he just holds out his stick. He doesn't even say a word. And when the marshal holds out his stick, you know that you have to follow him and that you're in trouble. So here's the marshal. He comes to the, to the, the home of Ursus and Dia and Gwynplaine. And he holds out the stick to Gwynplaine. And they are terrified. Gwynplaine follows him to jail and Ursus follows him too and they're terrified. They don't say a word. And Ursus sees Gwynplaine going into the jail and he waits outside. Now in the jail, Gwynplaine is terrified and they go to an underground chamber and he sees an old man on the floor naked with a heavy stone on him. He's obviously been tortured to have some kind of confession. <clears throat> and then the old man, as soon as he sees Gwynplaine, points at him and he says, that's him. And he dies. And Gwynplaine is like terrified. He's sure that they're accusing him of a crime they didn't commit. And he's like, no, I didn't do anything. I'm just a performer. I didn't do anything. And by the way, performers are like the lowest class in that society. And turns out this old man is Hartquinon. And he identified him as Lord Fermain Clancharlie. He is the legitimate child of the exiled revolutionary Lord Clancharlie. Turns out King James II was super mad at Lord Clancharlie for not coming back and not so ends up being a revolutionary. And he had his son kidnapped as a two-year-old and disfigured by this guy, Hardquinon, and given to the Comprachicos. So this obviously royalty, major, major mess up. But now that it's been discovered, how has it been discovered? Ooh, guess what? The bottle finally washed up after like 10 years. And who opened it? Barco Fedro. Barco Fedro opened it in front of Queen Anne. So they are, they take their rules seriously. They take their period seriously. And they say, hey, listen, Gwynplaine, you're not a performer anymore. You are now the highest position of the land. You're a lord. So he has inherited this massive estate. He's now going to be um, a lord in the House of Lords. He has tons of money. Ba boom He faints, by the way. Meanwhile, Ursus, he's been bringing a dead body out of the prison. Who's this dead body again? This body is actually hard put on. But he thinks it's a dead Gwynplaine, and he is heartbroken. He goes back home to the Barco Fedro, who, by the way, meanwhile, when Gwynplaine woke up in the palace, Barco Fedro was there. He told him, oh, my gosh, you have this. This is all yours. And he's like, what? But anyway, he told him, um, Gwynplaine, he gave him like 2,000 pounds or something. And Gwynplaine is like, oh, go give it to my father, right, to Ursus. Barco Fedro goes there. He gives him like five pounds of that, but he wants Ursus out because Barco Fedro is a nasty, nasty person. So he basically brings the marshal, and he's like, listen, your wolf is illegal and wolves were illegal, but nobody cared about it before. But Barco Fedro got the marshal on his case and he's like, your wolf is illegal. Either I take the wolf and I kill him or you leave England with your wolf. And that is exactly what they have to do. Ursus is not going to let his, his wolf homo be killed. So he has to sell the man, leave his very successful show. He was getting, earning pretty good money actually in London with the show. He has to pack it all up 
and he goes on the ship ready to leave England. He's heartbroken, he's shattered. He thinks he's going to plane his dad. His home is gone. His livelihood is gone. He has to leave his country, right? Awful. Meanwhile, when Plain is in this massive house, right, that he now owns, and Josiana actually lives there, because if you remember, she was using his estate because she was supposed to inherit it. And he finds her, and she's like, you know, dressed beautifully, and he's super tempted. There's this whole sexual temptation thing, because he saw her and thought she was beautiful too, also. And she's like, oh, I love you so much. And he was like, what? How do you love me? I'm so ugly, right? She had told him that before. She sent him a note that she, would, that she loved him. And here he is with his massive temptation, when suddenly... Um, Lord David Dorimar comes in. I don't remember if it was Lord David David Dorimar or Bakker Fledger who came in, but one of them came in and said to um, Zoziana, "Hey, listen, guess what? She, um, this guy is actually um, not just a poor performer. He's a lord. He's Clan Charlene. And guess what? Queen Anne said you have to marry him. And she, who went from like, oh, I love him so much, because he's different and it'll be so cool to marry someone from the lower class and it'll be amazing i can be like yep i'm so enchanted by his disfigured face right she was like being just very selfish and she was so bored she wanted something different suddenly when she finds out that he's really a noble she's like i hate you you're horrible you're ugly yes so she is horrible and by the way lord david during Mora also comes he's like who are you what are you doing there and there's that so Gwynplaine, um, who is kind of glad that Josiana went away because he's like, okay, whew, I'm going to go back to, um, you know, Dia, my true love. He decides, hey, I'm a lord. I'm going to use my position to help the poor, right? I can go help them now, now that I have all this power. So he goes to the House of Lords. He's sworn in as a lord. And people are very excited to see him. They, like, heard about the scandal and what happened, and they are excited to see him. So he's sitting there in the House of Lords. His face is in the shadows, so nobody sees him yet. They see him, but they don't see his face. And they are voting on a bill. And this bill is to give Queen Anne's husband um, a giant increase of salary for doing nothing. So again, just a complete waste of money. These people are very, very selfish, are completely out of touch with society. They don't have any clue about what's going on. And or if they do, they are ignoring it. So guess what happens? Uh, okay, sorry, I don't have to get rid of this. So now um, everyone says yes, yes, yes. And then it's his turn to vote. And he decides he makes a speech about the poor. And he says... Listen, everyone, um, you don't know what's going on. You're too wealthy. You're too out of touch. But there's everyone suffering outside. And, you know, we have the power to help them. And let's do something. And the lords are actually paying attention and they're inspired until they finally see his face. And then they all burst out laughing. And that is the curse of what happened to him. King James II and disfigured his face. And nobody can take him seriously because of his perpetual laugh. His perpetual laugh on his face makes everyone else smile. So this is part of his speech. It's actually a wonderful speech. It's beautiful. And here's some, some excerpts. I am come to impeach your happiness. It is fashioned out of the misery of your neighbor. You have everything, and that everything is composed of the nothing of others. Really good. So Gwynplaine is just devastated. You know, he's heartbroken. Here's Gwynplaine making a speech, right? They, they all have these ermine robes. And he's devastated. He goes out, and Lord David Dorimar, who's actually the only one to defend the speech, he duels him because he offended his mother in his statement by mentioning that she was a mistress. And he is just absolutely gone. He has, he doesn't like his political position. He doesn't like, he doesn't have family. He's like, okay, I'm done. I'm going to go home. Goodbye. I don't want to be a lord. Lord goes home, but nobody is there. Right? And then he's just utterly heartbroken. He's about to jump off a bridge, but then Homo the wolf grabs him and leads him back to the ship where he sees his adoptive father and his love, Dia. But unfortunately, because this is a Victor Hugo novel and nothing can go well. Dia, because she had thought that Gwynplaine was dead, is super, super frail and weak. And they reunite and they have this loving, tender moment. Oh, I'm so excited. We're going to be with you forever. We love you. We love you. We love you. But Dia's heart is so weak by the news she gives out and she dies. And Gwynplaine is devastated. Ursus has been sleeping. He didn't even see him there. Gwynplaine is so devastated, he jumps off the ship and he drowns. But apparently nobody knows how to swim. Anyway, that is the end. Bum bum. Very sad. So what is this connection to Purple Hyacinth? Okay, this is an inaccurate site. I thought it would be funny. No, I, I do have an idea. So obviously the main connection is that the whole story is about the rich oppressing the poor, and Purple Hyacinth has a lot about that, right? So that's an obvious connection. And now in terms of theory, here we go. So we don't know who the leader is, right? Who is the leader? It's a question we always ask ourselves. 
So I have a theory. The man who laughs is all about a monarch who disfigures a legitimate child to give it the illegitimate child power. Now, in Queer Crip Hyacinth, maybe Queen Elizabeth disfigures Kieran by making him a monster so that her illegitimate child can be a prince. So we see here, right, we know she is shady AF, right? There's a lot of interactions. We know about her putting down the snapdragon, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, see this little guy here, Arthur? Maybe she put him in, wanted him in power somehow. We know that she destroyed the snapdragon, she controls King Philip, and she has no sympathy for the poor. So perhaps Queen Elizabeth had King Edward killed so that her, by, by ordering the attack on the train so that her weak husband could rule, puppeted by her, and she has some role to play in the Phantom Scythe and behind, was behind Kirid's abduction. I don't know if she's the leader per se, because we know the leader was a man. That is a trouble, but I feel like she's involved somehow. Anywho, that is my theory. And let me know what you guys think. If it makes any sense, give me holes. I know it's not perfect, but I think it was definitely worth it to read this novel. And if you want to hear more about like the Batman version and the connection, you should go to the episode 38 podcast episode to hear about that. Thank you all and good.